It's rush hour. Pick your city. Hundreds, no thousands of vehicles are traversing the highway on their way home from work. Many of the cars, SUVs, trucks, and or vans only contain one occupant, the driver. Not the most efficient use of fuel, is it? Yet this scene is playing on repeat over and over and over again around this planet. What effect is all of this traveling having on the biosphere? Is the CO2 these vehicles are emitting changing the composition of the atmosphere? Is that change contributing to an increase in average global temperature? If so, what will this increase mean for our children? How about their children? Or their children's children? These are some of the key questions to which I'm trying to find answers. Are you ready to join me on this journey? Let's go. Empathy is a human superpower. It sparks our curiosity, engages our compassion, and animates our connection to all living things. Let us journey together towards understanding as we sail through space on this amazing ship we call planet Earth. This is The Empathic Ecologist. Why should I care? The answer to this question might seem obvious to some, but it still begs to be asked. If you've spent even a little bit of time reading social media feeds over the past six years, you have seen someone advocating for a cause. Be it Black Lives Matter, Me Too, MAGA, or marriage equality, it seems everyone has something they care about. Oh yeah, <laughs> and don't forget COVID-19. No joke, at some point during the pandemic, I noticed people beginning to talk about compassion fatigue. Simply put, empathy requires energy, and each of us only has so much of it to invest. So why should we invest any of it in caring about climate change? One word, survival. If the planet is indeed warming at the rate I have read about in my early research, then future generations of Americans may very literally be facing a struggle for survival. Those of us who are at least middle class or above have no idea what it feels like to face starvation. Case in point, if I'm hungry for just an hour or two, I can get cranky, even hangry. I have no clue what it's like to look in the mirror and see an emaciated, skeletal face staring back at me because I have literally had nothing to eat in weeks. Get that picture in your mind. Okay, now imagine it happening to your grandkids make it personal. What if temperatures get so high that our crops just start dying off? That shit could happen. Am I just being an alarmist? I don't know. That's what I want to find out. So here goes. Let's dive in to the data. According to NASA's Earth Observatory, quote, most of Earth's carbon about 65,500 billion metric tons is stored in rocks. The rest is in the ocean, atmosphere, plants, soil, and fossil fuels." Unquote. That is, to put it mildly, a ton of carbon. See what I did there? <laughs> All those carbon atoms are moving in a constant cycle between land, atmosphere, and oceans. This is what's known as the carbon cycle. To illustrate, let's take a look at this diagram of the fast carbon cycle which has been adapted from the U.S. Department of Energy's Biological and Environmental Research Information System. The yellow numbers indicate natural fluxes in carbon levels, while the red numbers indicate human contributions. Numbers in white represent stored carbon. All are measured in gigatons. If you turn your attention to the top left corner of the diagram, we will begin by looking at the natural downward part of the carbon cycle. Approximately 120 gigatons of carbon are transferred from the atmosphere to the biosphere, which is where we live, by the way, via processes such as photosynthesis. Organisms containing carbon, plants, animals, and the like, 
die and decompose, transferring their carbon into the soil, which stores approximately 2,300 gigatons of carbon. If we go a little deeper, below the soil we can find fossilized carbon, primarily in the form of coal deposits. This adds up to roughly 10,000 gigatons of stored carbon. Leaving the land for the Earth's ocean, we observe that approximately 90 gigatons of carbon are transferred from the atmosphere to the oceans each year. Some of this carbon, about two gigatons, combined with the carbon contained in organisms which have died in the oceans, whales, dolphins, octopi, etc., travels all the way down to the ocean floor where it becomes a part of the sedimentary level. Reactive sediments store about 6,000 gigatons of carbon. And we are finished with the downward portion of the cycle. Now on to the carbon which travels up. Starting back on the left of the diagram again, we see that plant respiration accounts for 60 gigatons of carbon release into the atmosphere each year. Microbial respiration and decomposition contributes another 60 gigatons. The ocean's surface level, which stores 1,000 gigatons of carbon, releases approximately 90 gigatons of that carbon into the atmosphere. Now we come to the human contribution. It is important to note that, quote, any change in the cycle that shifts carbon out of one reservoir puts more carbon in the other reservoirs, unquote. So says NASA's Earth Observatory. This is why we humans are responsible for two gigatons of carbon per year traveling back down to the biosphere and another three gigatons into the oceans. Since we are currently pumping about nine gigatons of carbon per year into the atmosphere, this means that a good portion of what we pump out remains in the atmosphere itself. According to Lawrence Krauss in his book The Physics of Climate Change, this carbon will remain there for a long time. So, if our carbon emissions are indeed inducing climate change, this means that the current mean temperature levels will remain artificially high even after we have stopped pumping carbon into the air. But, that leads me to my next question. 